Hey guys, thanks for joining us for this 124th episode in Season 2 of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. Special guests on this episode include author and daughter of the late Eartha Kit, Kit Shapiro. We'll be talking about the memoir, Eartha and Kit, a daughter's love story in black and white. We'll also visit with debut author K.L. Harris. We'll talk about her new book, Aquilian's Key. And we'll also visit with singer and songwriter Zachariah Malachi. He's got a single and album entitled Local Bar, Opry Star. Of course, if you would, please take the time to subscribe, comment, leave some feedback, check out the shop, and of course, share with your friends. Well, a new study by someone in Rush Order Tees revealed the most popular band tees across all genres. The most popular, not surprisingly, ACDC. It's followed number two by Aerosmith, number three, Queen, number four, Pink Floyd, number five, Green Day. Wrapping out the top 10 are Bob Marley, The Foo Fighters, The Beatles, Prince, and Ariana Grande. Eminem, Metallica, and Nirvana just missed the top 10. The question is, do you have a most prized band tee in your closet? Author and uh, daughter of the late Eartha Kitt got a new book to talk about. Eartha and Kitt, a daughter's love story in black and white. And we've got Kit Shapiro on with us. And first off, Kit, I appreciate you taking some time to be on the show. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me. Now, Kit, when was the process of this book? I mean, when did you first sit down and, and start the process of writing? Well, the process started about two years ago where um, my co-writer, uh, Patty Weiss, and I sat down and we started to formulate uh, the the bat, the these chapters and the, the idea for each chapter. Um, but it wasn't until during COVID that we actually sat down and physically, you know, put pen to paper and, and I wrote, you know, every single chapter. And that was, uh, by the way, a brutal process. I have a uh, <laughs> newfound respect for authors. I must say you're all very talented. <laughs> <laughs> now, how much did the ideas or the inspiration change as you started putting pen to paper? Did it change and, and evolve as the process went on? Um, it did in that, you know, when we first started, it was really just about sharing the stories and, and, and who, you know, growing up with this unique woman. And then obviously as, as the last couple of years has, have changed socially and, and politically, um, it became a little bit more about, you know, showing who my mother was. And I taught the t book being titled A Daughter's Love Story in Black and White um, and showing about the differences the way my mother and I look. Um, I'm much lighter skin and blonde hair mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and how and but I am her biological child um, and, and how the importance of, of having empathy and before each other as is human beings and our unique qualities and embracing them. And I think that that's really when, the, when the publisher um, Pegasus books and Simon and Schuster decided to, to take this book on uh, it was important to, you know, to keep these, these, co these conversations going. And I certainly feel that way from my social media and the trolls out there who say, you know, terrible things about, you know, how I can't possibly be her daughter or her biological daughter because I don't look anything like her and how, narrow-minded and ignorant people are and that we really or can be I shouldn't say they are that can be <laughs> and how important it is to keep talking about um the fact that we are all different and we should all embrace those differences and if everybody went and got a DNA test we would all see how different we are and we could stop <laughs> arguing over these silliness this is like we've got enough in this world to deal with we don't need to be arguing over how you know that we all look different who cares we're humans so anyway, that's my little, my soapbox <laughs> for today. Now, Kit, as you were growing up, how was it that Eartha taught you about race and, and to feel comfortable in your skin? Because like you said, there's there's trolls and folks, and, and I know she had to know that that was a possibility as well. Well, I think my mother really felt that, you know, she had been treated so, you know, so badly uh, in the South. She was born in, the, in South Carolina and, and she was referred to as a yellow gal because she wasn't quote, dark enough. Her skin was, you know, she was too light skinned. Um, and then of course she, she came up North and then she was, you know, not, he was too dark skinned. So she was kind of caught in this place of, of not having, and uh, people didn't want to, neither, neither race wanted to identify uh, as, as her being a part of it. 
Um, I think on some level, she loved the fact that I was this mutt and that I was so mixed that you couldn't really pinpoint, you know, who I was or where I was from. And, and I, and that she wanted people to, to not, you know, fight about and argue about uh, the, you know, the, the color of our skin that she felt that there were, we're so much more than, than the color of our skin. And, and that's something we don't have a choice to, you know, we, we can't right. choose how we're born, what we look like. So why are we arguing over um, that we're different because we look different um, when there's so much other, you know, beauty in, inside of humans. Um, so growing up, she wanted to make sure that I understood her life, her background, who she was, what she had experienced, but it wasn't just her. She told me about, you know, just history of, of peoples and, and indigenous peoples from around the world and what every, you know, what everybody had gone through, you know, in their own cultures uh, because she felt that knowledge is power. And the more that you understood um, and you could, you know, hopefully have empathy and be able to accept and, and respect um, who we are. And Kit, for you to have the the final product now and, and have the opportunity to look at it, I mean, what is your takeaway? What is your hopeful takeaway of the of the readers as well? Um, that people will learn that, you know, I mean, yes, that they'll embrace this woman who they maybe they knew, maybe they didn't know that she was a famous person, but will will really learn the, that, you know, how important it is that we talk about our, our legacies. Uh, we all have a legacy. You know, my mother happened to be famous, but we all have somebody in our family or stories of family stories that we that we that I think it's important that we share with each other. And that we continue to learn and to understand um, who we are as human beings, what our families were, what our traditions, what our beliefs. Um, because I think the more that we share this with each other, the more that we can, you know, just live hopefully in a little bit more peace. We can just, you know, embrace their differences and, and maybe smile and, and say nice things to each other instead of being trolls and, and nastiness on social media. And that is something we could learn in 2021 as well as any other time as well. Right. So true. So, so true. But maybe now more than ever, because now we're connected like we never were before. Right. Right. That is right. And again, the the new book, Eartha and Kit, A Daughter's Love Story in Black and White. And Kit, I always want to make sure and let our listeners know where they can find not only more info about the book, but everything you've got going social media wise as well. Well, you can find me on, on Instagram, Kit Shapiro. You can find me on Facebook, Kit Shapiro page. Uh, you can go to my website, which is simplyeartha.com. And you can also go to the Eartha Kit on Facebook. There you go. Well, Kit, it has been a true privilege to visit with you. Looking forward to spending some more time with the book and hope you have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Same to you. Now, with school starting back up, three out of five parents say that they're stressed about having to pack their kids' lunch again, especially because your kid might not even eat it all anyway. The poll looked at some of the most common things kids leave uneaten at lunch, and yes, vegetables are number one. But we were surprised that kids leave a lot of junk food behind, too. Like I said, number one was vegetables. 83% of parents make sure veggies are in there, but it's the part of their lunch that they're least likely to eat. Number two, fruit. Number three, the main part of their meal. Number four, salty snacks. And number five, sweet snacks. Now, the poll also found parents spend an average of $390 extra on groceries per child during the school year got a book to talk about, uh, an award-winning book at that called Aquilian's Key. We've got author K.L. Harris on the line with us today. And first off, K.L., I appreciate you taking some time to be on the show. Thank you so much for having me. Pleasure to be here. Now, writing wasn't always the end game that you saw in Envisioned, was it, for your life? Uh, originally, no. Where did the writing inspiration, when did you know that you had a gift to write that, and how much of a surprise was it to you? Yeah, well, it, it's interesting. Actually, it's a very interesting question because um, I've, I've realized now that I've always been a writer, um, but it took me a long time to figure that out. And I think the reason why is because it's been something that's always just been very natural to me. My mom was a writer when I was a kid and um, I used to, I just loved fantasy and reading. And 
So for fun, I used to sit down and just kind of write up my own little like, oh, instead of playing make-believe, I'm going to sit here and just (laughs) write out a scene. And that's like me playing. And um, I pursued an acting career for many years. And if I had an audition where I just couldn't find a monologue that fit the part that I wanted to use, I would just write my own. Um, but I never thought about it. It was just something like, oh, yeah, that's just you know something that I did. And and then um, there's just I just got to a point in my life where the acting bug just left me. Um, it was just after I met my husband and he's like, I was like, I don't know what I'm going to do. Like, this is what I've done my whole life. And I wanted it so passionately. And now that passion just gone. And he's like. Well, is there anything else they've ever wanted to do? I was like, I always wanted to write a book. And he's like, well, why don't you just give that a go? So, <laughs> so I I did. And it took me seven years to write that first book. But by wow. the end of the process, I was like, oh, my gosh, this is what I've always meant to be doing. Now, Aquilian's Key, it's it's the first book in a, in a Night Watcher series. Tell us was was the series uh, the original concept when you started on it? No, <laughs> I had no idea where I was going when I started this book. Um, I don't know if you've ever heard the term, but um, people have this term for writers, pantsers or plotters. Mm-hmm. And a pantser is somebody who writes by the seat of their pants. And a plotter is somebody who sits down and plots out the entire thing before they start. And when I started this novel, I was a complete pantser. (laughs) I I just, I had nothing planned out. I didn't know where I was going or what I was doing. And I've always loved stories for characters more than anything. So I kind of just started with the characters and just started exploring. And um, I think, yeah, it eventually turned into this epic world and journey. And now that I'm almost finished with the second book, I'm a complete plotter. <laughs> <laughs> now tell us, uh, Aquilian's Key, if folks haven't heard of it, tell our listeners just a little bit about the concept behind Aquilian's Key. Yeah, excellent. So um, Aquilian's Key, Aquilian is actually the name of the fantasy world. And um, it's it's all about these three characters. It's very much kind of a coming of age story where they set out um, – just kind of in their in their normal everyday lives, and then they're tossed into this adventure um, that takes them into these three separate journeys that kind of have much, as in destiny has much bigger plans for them than they had ever planned for themselves. Um, and it's complete adventure, fast-paced story, and I just wanted to set it into a world that can really take you in and be fun and overwhelming and just um, just kind of really getting your imagination going in fun and colorful ways. Um, so <laughs> it's hard for me to tell you too much about the story without giving things away, but the main <laughs> characters, they're um, con artists that just kind of live on the street and they have no big plans um, to accomplish anything in life, but being able to just basically get enough coin or money to be able to um, change their stars and and live a more fulfilling life. Um, but a lot more is in store for them. <laughs> now, you must be the ultimate bedtime storyteller, I, I would guess. Am I right? <laughs> it's true. <laughs> yeah, I've got uh, two young kids, and they'll often ask me to just tell them a story at night. So that's that's a lot of fun. Now, we talked about being award-winning and uh, getting a silver medal from the Independent Publisher Book Awards. And what t- explain to us what a brag medallion is. I mean, I-, I know what it sounds like it would be if I had one, but <laughs> what- what's a brag medallion for you? Yeah, the brag medallion is quite wonderful, actually. It's... Um... It's, uh, oh, what is it? It stands for exactly every single uh, letter in brag stands for something specific. And I wish <laughs> I wish it was coming to mind right this second. But it's this great group um, that that basically um, you can submit your work to them and um, they send it off to real real readers. So it's a group of basically they put the book forward to these groups of readers and they can choose to read it or not. So your book won't even get looked at um, unless it piques their interest. Mm. And then if they do decide that they want to read it, um, then there's a group 
um, whoever decides that they want to read it, reads it, a whole bunch of people. And um, then they rate it and they, they write things about it and they give it a rating and a whole report and everything. And you only get a brag medallion if it's something that they think is, is worthy to be read. So <laughs> I was very honored to get that actually. Now for you, Kira, what's it like to get the feedback from the book and also to see the anticipation for book two coming out next year as well? Oh, it's, it's wonderful, amazing, and, and nerve wracking all at the same time. <laughs> um, it's been, it was actually a big surprise to me because this is my first book and um, I had no idea what I was doing when I started writing it and um, coming from kind of the film industry where I used to make a lot of short films and I'd write stuff myself and produce the whole thing. Um, and I knew from going through that process that, you know, you, you, when you start doing anything for the first time, it's a stumble through. It's like, well, you know, you're, you just make your first one and you get through it so that then you can get on to your next one and right. just kind of learn the process. So when I wrote this book, I completely wrote it for myself. I started in the beginning thinking, oh, what's, what's cool right now? What will people enjoy? And, <laughs> and it just wasn't working. So I threw that out the window and was just wrote what I wanted to read. And by the time um, I got to the end of the process, I was like, I don't even know if anyone's gonna like this book. I was like, I I have no idea, this is my first (laughs) book, I'll put it out there. And so so I was just overwhelmed by the response. Um, And it's been such a joy to just see that other people are loving it and wanting to read it. Now you talked about uh, putting your first book out there. The biggest thing is just getting through it and learning from it. What did you learn most from your first publication? Probably just to trust myself. Mm. Um, I think, you know, I think there's this tendency when people start to write for the first time that, you know, they, they don't know what they're doing. So they, they read a bunch of books or try techniques or, or whatever. And, um, at the end of the day, you're never going to be able to write your best book or even, you know, a, a really, really great book unless you throw all of that out the window and you just tell your story. Um, and so, yeah, I think that's definitely for me what I learned the most of is is to write about what I love and I enjoy and, you know, all my favorite parts of the world and the things I'm curious about. And it was when I kind of did that and let go of everything else um, that it really started all coming together. Now, Kira, who are the other authors that inspire you, that their work inspires you, inspired you to even have the interest in writing in the first place? Yeah, um, I grew up as an avid reader. I've always loved fantasy. Um, and probably the the biggest books that kind of inspired my writing was um, the Dark Material series by Philip Pullman, mm-hmm. um, Peter Pan, um, the original Peter Pan, absolutely loved, um, and a lot of classics. And it's interesting because even though I grew up loving fantasy and and absolutely wanted to be in a fantasy world, um, that was my dream when I was a kid. And then I, I grew up and I traveled the world and started doing all of these things in the world and realized how cool our world was, mm-hmm. is, and, um, and I stopped reading fantasy for a long time, actually. I kind of just got more interested in our world. So it's interesting because it wasn't until... Um, until I was really interested in our world that I all the sudden wanted to write a fantasy one. Um, but yeah, it, it really inspires me. So I, now I find myself drawn to the classics. Um, so yeah, great Gatsby is one of my all time favorite books and, um, just things like, um, um, the art of war and, and, um, the Zen and the art of archery, and just kind of a whole bunch of, I love going back into old books. Like currently I'm reading um, um, National Humor, mm. which is over a hundred year old <laughs> book. And it talks about humor between Scotland and Ireland and America. And I just love it because <laughs> it's such an insight into people and humor and the different humor of different places and 
yeah, so that's kind of what inspires my work more than anything these days. Now, the, during the pandemic, did that help your imagination? Did it hinder your imagination during uh, during this this last year and a half? Um, you know, it didn't really have a huge effect because we moved over here just at the end of 2019, right before the pandemic hit. And to be honest, it didn't really, I, I probably would have been in the same position either way because... We just moved over to, you know, across the world. We were juggling <laughs> one car um, and I'm a writer, so I work from home anyway. Um, and, you know, we have two young children, so um, I'm home with the, the kids a lot. My youngest is four. Um, so it didn't really, I kind of just felt like the rest of the world was was falling into doing the same thing I was doing <laughs> right. that I would have been doing anyway. <laughs> Um, but it did spark my interest. I have to admit, I did start thinking about it a little bit, um, in just a sense of future books of maybe writing some sci-fi and how this whole thing would influence that. And there's, there's a lot of interesting things that I think we'll see come out of it within the literary world. So I'm excited about that. Yeah. That's one of the things I've always wondered is, you know, the, the arts, they always, mimic life and uh, it, whenever we go through big tragedies big events you always see it in the arts and what do you see coming from it on on the literary side um a, a lot of things you know one of the big things is just the fact of how it it affects people socially mm -hmm. you know even when i was writing my book um I'm, talk about kind of greetings because when I first moved to Australia, um, people don't really shake hands over here. It's like, it's more traditional when they first meet you to kiss you on the cheek and give you a little hug, which for me as an American, when I first moved over here was like, <laughs> Hey, I don't know you, <laughs> you know? And, and so it, it sparked my imagination early on of like, you know, different greetings and how we grow up in certain cultures and um, how that affects us. But now, you know, nobody greets with a shaking hand or definitely not a kiss on the cheek because of the way this whole situation has changed us. And so it made me really have to step back and think about that of like, oh, if I put this stuff in my book, what's going to be the effect on the reader reading it after going through this whole situation? And yeah, how's that going to change literature? You know, it's if people can't interact with each other, I could see it for me. I could see it going into the whole um, virtual reality realm, mm. right? People can't meet in person. So you want to meet in more of a virtual room. And that could be the whole social interaction is all virtual, you know, things like that. It'll, it'll be interesting. I'm sure there's a lot of fun stuff that'll come out of it. <laughs> now, for you in the writing process, is it harder to edit things down or to find content to fill in, I guess, uh, is the question. Oh, um, I, don't, I don't know. I mean, I, I think it's never it's never hard for me to fill things in. Uh, that's, that's never, never really an issue, but editing down, I don't feel like it's really taking out content. It's more of kind of getting down to the truth of the characters and the situation to make sure that everything's fully believable. And, you know, the characters are speaking true to their nature and nothing in the story has conflicts and just polishing up. Um, just the flow and the grammar and all of that kind of stuff. So I've never really had, I've definitely had to do some major editing to scenes, but it was more about would this really happen or would it have happened differently and having to change it to something that was more true to the situation and the characters than having to take out content because it was just too much. Now, do you find that because of your acting background, is it easier for you to to build the characters from the ground up because of having to have taken on so many characters in, in your roles, if you will? Definitely. I am so grateful for my acting background um, for that reason and for many others. Yeah, definitely. I mean, for me, my my stories are very character driven. Um, I love characters. I always have. And I love writing because now I can play every type of character, which I could not <laughs> do before. So that's that's really fun. But I've, I've always loved improv. And um, for me, improv was all about um, not improv. Improv is in 
we did this thing in acting called a hot seat where you would build your own character or if you had a character for a play or a film or something, um, you would build everything from their background and then you sit in a chair and then everybody else would interview you and you have to answer as the character. Um, that kind of improv, which I always loved, because once you have the whole background of your character down, it's really fun to just live in that character and be able to speak freely as them. Um, and for me, that's that's what writing is. You know, I get to once I get into the nitty gritty details of the characters, they really take on a life of their own. Um, and it's so much fun to kind of jump into their skin and be able to just improv my way through the story as them. Like, oh, what would they do in this situation? What would they say to this? And for you, is it hard to get out of the book mode whenever you've been writing? Is it hard for you to come back to the grips of reality if that's all around you? <laughs> um, that's never that's never been an issue for me. Um, I've because I've got young kids. I've had to write these books very much on small little moments. Um, and so I've actually gotten pretty good. It took me a while, but I've gotten pretty good with being able to just jump straight into the world and, and come back out of it again. Um, and yeah, that's not a problem for me at all. Luckily, <laughs> knock on wood. <laughs> to this point, at least she said that. <laughs> yeah, that's it. <laughs> Hopefully it stays that way. That's right. Now, again, the book, uh, Quillian's Key, author K.L. Harris. I, I want to make sure and let our listeners know if they want to find more info about uh, Quillian's Key, about the uh, upcoming books also in the series, where can they find out online and also social media? Keep up with everything you're going there as well. Yeah, excellent. Well, the best place to go is straight to my website, which is www.masterofmakebelieve.com. And that will give you portals to all different places that you can buy the book from. You can just Google the book and get it from just about any online bookstore. Um, but Equillion, I understand, is a bit of a, a tricky name. So <laughs> um, if you go straight to the website, that's the easiest. Um, I'm also on social media as Master of Make Believe, Facebook, Pinterest, and Instagram. All right. Well, Kira, it has been great to visit with you. I appreciate you taking some time out and uh, looking forward to sitting down, spending some more time with Aquilian's Key, and hopefully we can catch up again real soon. That sounds great. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Now, I have at least 20 things in my closet that I never wear. So maybe this makes sense. A new study at Washington State found Gen Zers are much more willing to rent clothes instead of buy them. Now, they talked to over 350 adults who were around 25 to 30 years of age. They still want their clothes to be fashionable, but they don't necessarily need to own them. Now, it's partly about money, but also sustainability. Young people tend to care more about recycling clothes and not wasting resources. When you include everything from shirts to socks, the average person buys 67 new pieces of clothing every year. Our final guest on the episode today, a country singer, songwriter, I guess I should say a honky-tonker as well, Zachariah Malachi with us today. And, and first off, Zachariah, I appreciate your time, man. No, Cameron, thank you so much for having me. This is fun. Now tell us, where did music come from? You grew up in Michigan, am I correct? Or I guess first question should be Wolverine or Spartan, and then the rest of the interview will follow accordingly. I feel, <laughs> I feel like uh, I kind of, uh, just because I'm downstate, I have more ties with Dearborn, Michigan, and Ann Arbor. I'd have to go with, uh, with U of M on that. Uh, but nothing against the Spartans. To be honest with you, I'm not much of a sports guy anyway, so... <laughs> I feel like I have more ties to you of them than, uh, you know, Michigan state. But like I said, I'm, I'm the worst person in the world to talk that kind of stuff with. So. <laughs> Where did music and, and your love for traditional country music? I mean, the, the sound that's out, uh, where, where did that come from for you? Uh, you know, uh, probably just the fact that I was a Michigan kid. Sure. But like, uh, my mom's side of the family, my dad's side of the family were both Southern. I grew up in Southeast Michigan, and uh, most of the families at the time came up here uh, in the 40s and 50s because of the auto industry. 
So uh, I was raised on all that and I was definitely the oddball because uh, I grew up in a very uh, Polish driven community. It's, it's a little town called Wyandotte, Michigan. Mm -hmm. Uh, And mostly Polish people lived here. So it was definitely different for me being a Southern kid, you know, or from a Southern family. So I kind of was raised on all that stuff, you know, uh, Hank Williams, Johnny Cash, uh, all of that stuff was just huge parts of me growing up, Merle Haggard, Jones, all of it. Now for you, the, uh, the, the trip into Nashville, what was your first time into Nashville? Like, uh, did it live up to expectations before you came in? The first time I came to town, I was little, I was a young kid. Um, and I remember going, I was in East Tennessee. My grandparents lived in East Tennessee and I spent a lot of time in the summer there. And uh, my folks took me to East Tennessee one summer, particularly, and they said, let's just, you know, take the trip to Music City. Let's go out there. And, you know, because I loved country, so I wanted to see it. I wanted to experience it. And I was always looking for Hank Williams stuff. I thought (laughs) I thought for sure I was like, there'd be be Hank Williams stuff everywhere. It's Nashville. There's going to be. And I remember getting there and I couldn't find anything on Hank Williams really anywhere. And this was like probably the mid to late 90s. That was my first trip to Nashville. And, uh, I just remember, uh, getting to see a lot of things. I don't remember exactly where I went, but I do remember to the, you know, seeing the hall of fame. And then I also remember, uh, seeing George Jones at a gas station. (laughs) That was like one memory I think I'll always have was seeing George Jones pull out of a gas station. (laughs) You're not the first person that's told me that I've had several artist friends that said that, especially in his later years, he really enjoyed just going out and he loved going to convenience stores and just visiting and, and talking to fans that he really got off on that. How about that? Yeah. And it's crazy too, because since I've lived there, I, uh, there's one restaurant that's my favorite restaurant in town and it's actually in cool Springs. Uh, so it's near Franklin and it's called Cajun steamer and, uh, they've got the best Cajun food I've ever had in my life and come to find out that was Jones's favorite restaurant too. So you guys have a, l- a little kinship, huh? <laughs> yes. Yeah. We had some Cajun love that we share. <laughs> now was, what was the first instrument for you? Was the, was it the rhythm guitar? As I read, was that the first thing that you started playing or was there something before that? The fiddle was the first really? instrument I ever played. Uh, and it was just so different. I was in elementary school and I wanted to play the fiddle, but you know, I didn't know that there was a huge difference between the fiddle and the violin. And uh, I thought that if I went and joined like the school orchestra up in Yankee, Michigan, that, you know, (laughs) that I would, I'd learn to play the fiddle. Like I thought, okay, I'll get to play some fiddle music. And I was very wrong. Uh, (laughs) We learned like all classical stuff. And I remember my teacher was the coolest person in the world because he, uh, he never made me stick to classical music. Like I would, everybody would go home and learn Swan Lake and I would come back in and play, Hey, good look at, you know? <laughs> and I think he just was excited that I was interested in the instrument. He didn't really care as much to hold me to the curriculum. He just knew that I was passionate about music, you know? So that was really cool. And I'm, I'm glad that he didn't have that stifling, you know, uh, I don't know that stifling side to him because he definitely furthered my interest in wanting to play music by letting me kind of learn the instrument as I went, you know. Now, how much different is the fiddle transposing over to guitar? How di- how difficult was the transition, if you will? I kind of just had to treat them as two different things. I remember I picked up the guitar when I was probably around 15 years old, and I wanted Dad to teach me some chords to, I think it was something like Cold, Cold Heart or Folsom Prison Blue, something like this, something super simple. So he showed me the three chords. And then from there, I would just look up chords and try to figure out how to play. And then overdoing that after an amount of time, I kind of just wanted to learn as much as I possibly could about rhythm guitar and about chord structures and sevenths and minors and sixths, you know, and then try to kind of figure my way out about it. But I remember there's definitely no correlation between the fiddle and the guitar (laughs) from my experience. It was like I had to treat it as a whole new monster, you know, Now, tell us uh, about the sound on the single Local Bar, Opry Star. I know the album, the single as well. And how did you come up with this one? Where did this one come from for you? To be honest, I, I had a feeling this question was going to come up. And I was always like, okay, how do I answer this? Because it, it's kind of got an interesting answer. I, I wrote the song as a response to somebody else writing an Opry song. 
And uh, it was almost like a bet that a friend of mine, they're like, you know, they're like, you're passionate about the opera. You could write one that's uh, more enthusiastic than this one. So I was like, okay, I'll give it a shot. So I ended up writing this shuffle, you know, and it, it's literally a two chord shuffle. And uh, it was just about my experience as being a country singer uh, playing these small time honky tonks all over Michigan into Ohio. And we, I mean, I was just your typical weekend warrior doing it all the time and request getting requests for Webb Pierce or Farron Young or Lefty for sale. And, uh, I just wanted to write my experience. So that's sort of where the single came from is it was just my experience of being somebody who was the, the small town country star that knew all of these old songs that people requested. That's pretty much where I got the idea for it. Who is the one that you tried to emulate maybe the most in your early days? Was it, was it Hank? It was Hank for sure. I mean, it was to the point where like, uh, it, it, my, my parents were like, stop doing that. Like you you have a voice, <laughs> you know how your, your folks are. You've got a great voice. Why are you trying so hard to be? But then I realized after looking at country music history too, uh, you see, you could listen, you could look up on YouTube, uh, Ernest Tubb or Hank Snow. Uh, if you look up their earliest recordings, they tried so hard to be Jimmy Rogers, mm -hmm. you know, and, uh, it, it was, it's, it's something that comes so honest, you know? So I think everybody does it a little bit when they first start out is they just kind of want to be whoever their idol was, you know, before they able to find who they are as an artist, who their creativity is. And, being able to pull all the influences that they have into what they do instead of just one main influence. So I, yeah, definitely Hank Williams was somebody I always wanted to be when I was a kid. The timing would have been perfect if you were a boxcar Willie fan. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> Some of that stuff, man. I love it. I love watching his old videos on YouTube where he'll just do like a 20 minute Hank medley. Super cool. <laughs> I love the ambiance. That's good stuff right there. <laughs> oh but yeah. Right. Yeah. I'm actually, I'm in Michigan now. Uh, so I just, I, I had a run of shows in Northern Michigan. I'm stopping back off at the folks house where I head back to Nashville here in the next couple of days. So uh, it, it's, it's definitely taking me back to roots here in that old train go by. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's good stuff. Now tell us, I know you're doing solo stuff, but also uh, playing in a couple of bands as well. I mean, how do you, how are you able to split your time or do you really have to have all your minutes down uh, pretty close to keep the schedules separate? Um, you know, uh, being in Nashville and playing in, you know, traditional or honky tonk bands, uh, the way I've always looked at it is this is a good way to refine your skills as an entertainer is to be on stage and to get to talk to a crowd and get to figure out how a crowd can maintain their enthusiasm about the show they're watching. You know, you don't want to take them on a huge upper of songs and then drop it down real low. And then they get bored and leave or go through four, you know, slow songs in a row and get it to where everybody's like falling asleep at their beer, <laughs> but, but, um, you know, it's, it's definitely hard to juggle, uh, between, you know, writing original songs and trying to maintain that while you're doing, uh, five to six nights a week with other bands. Um, I'm still trying to walk the plank on figuring out how to maintain both sides of that coin, but it's, it's just trying to stay motivated mostly and not getting too docile when you're not playing and not, you know, Oh, I could do it tomorrow. You know, you kind of got to <laughs> stop that mentality. It's, it gets to me sometimes. So now how much different are the crowds, the fans at the live events now, as opposed to before pandemic? Um, honestly, uh, with Nashville, at least it's definitely hard to see a difference. I remember at first, um, you could just tell people were busting at the seams to get back out and to go full swing and party. Um, they did not want to wait around anymore. Uh, people were coming from their hometowns, which were locked down to Nashville, which had very, very few regulations really. Uh, and they were just going crazy. Uh, we had s some bar fights. We've had uh, some really, I mean, I had to talk to a detective on the phone for two hours one night wow. after a brawl had broke out. Uh, due to the fact that they weren't supposed to dance and the bouncer at uh, Robert's Western world was trying to, uh, you know, regulate the rules that the mayor had set into place and uh, a, a brawl had broke out. Um, so people, people, yeah, I mean, you would just tell the tensions were high and people were wanting to do what they wanted to do, you know? Um, so aside from the rowdiness that comes with people being cooped up for a year, uh, <laughs> I, now Nashville's in full swing. 
it's really crazy. Uh, nothing has slowed down that town much except for the couple weeks that, you know, uh, it had some, some downtime because of the pandemic. But I think Nashville probably was one of the least places, you know, or spent the least amount of time locked up compared to so many other places like California and New York. So now what did you have to alter the most, uh, over this last year during maybe song rights? Is it learning technology, social media, maybe TikTok? What's been the, the biggest challenge for you? Um, I, I jumped on the TikTok train a little bit and then I ended up taking like half of my videos and putting them on me only, uh, because, uh, I, I was like, okay, this is silly stuff. Like I'm trying to still <laughs> wrap my head around how TikTok works. Um, it, it's definitely been a struggle uh, to try to understand, you know, how most of that stuff goes. Um, I'm still learning how the TikTok algorithm works. Instagram has been something I've been tinkering with, with a, for a while, but uh, yeah, I mean the social media bug, I've got friends who are really good at it, but I'm still trying to figure out, you know, the, the best way to work it. What has songwriting inspiration been like for you since things have opened back up? Has it helped you in your writing or have you been so busy with other things that it's made it more of a challenge lately? It's made it more of a challenge recently. But when I first moved to Nashville, I moved there on Valentine's Day of 2020. And um, right before everything shut down, and it was kind of a good thing, too, at the time, because when it shut down, I had just moved to town and my life had completely changed anyways from where I was. So I had a lot of, uh, a lot to write about. I had a lot to, to kind of base. Um, I actually wrote a whole record during lockdown of stuff just that I was thinking that was weighing on me, you know, and it was kind of cool when I got to uh, where I'm living now, uh, I was reading Tom T Hall's book about moving to Nashville as well. So that was pretty cool. Like I had to share a lot of experiences with his novel about what it was like moving and, and his luck and what was going on with me at the time. And I remember I'd get so inspired by reading his book that I would like, uh, you know, go out and make, make emails to different people in town or to different publishers or different, just trying to get ahead, but nothing was open at the time. So no one was responding or nobody was getting back to me, you know, Oh, well we could meet, but we can't meet right now because of COVID or, (laughs) you know, so it's like you want, I had so much motivation to get out there, but because of the pandemic, it wasn't letting me do anything. You know. Now, because of the time that's passed since he wrote it, wh- what are some of the things that you've seen that have changed the most from the time when he came to town as opposed to when you came? Um, definitely, he'll name a lot of the places that he used to vacate a lot. Uh, and they definitely aren't, uh, they're not there anymore. That's one of the biggest things. And also how easy it was back in the day to just walk into a place Right. And uh, to talk to somebody, you could walk right in, you know, and say hello and talk to somebody. And nowadays, you know, you don't, you can't really solicit like you used to, you know, uh, it was definitely more accessible and Nashville was more of a small town back then, you know, and it's not like that anymore. You've got uh, hundreds of thousands, I'd say, you know, of a difference compared to what it was. in I think what year was it? The mid sixties. Nashville. Yeah, I'm here. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> but, um, but yeah, yeah, it was just a, it's a huge difference, put it that way. But I, the one story that always was cool to me, I'm a huge Webb Pierce fan. And uh, Tom T was at a bar. I forgot which bar it was it's in the book, but he says that he got so excited he wanted to walk up and say hello to Webb Pierce. He was in a booth talking with somebody. And as Tom T was walking across the bar to say hello to him, Webb looked over and saw him and lifted up and grabbed the curtain and closed the curtain to the booth so nobody <laughs> could come over and talk to us. <laughs> and that's something people don't really think about coming into Nashville is just the regular person, whenever you go to restaurants, Nashvilleians know you don't you don't necessarily bother the other artists either, do you? No, I think like, you know, uh, there's definitely a fine line. You know, that's one thing that I think Californians love the most about Nashville is the privacy aspect of it, where if you are in the industry of any sort, you don't have people bombarding you. I think that it's okay if you want to say hello to somebody. It's definitely different than if you want to be a germ and kind of be stuck (laughs) on somebody the whole time. You know, but definitely acknowledging them saying hello or good morning or thank you for something. You know, I think that that's totally respectable and cool. But uh, yeah, definitely walking up to try to get ahead, you know, is is definitely what sets the residents from the tourists apart, you know. 
That's right. Now, the single, the album as well, I, I want to make sure and let our listeners know where they can find more info on that, your social media, website, upcoming tour dates, everything going on. Yeah, I, I, I have a website, uh, ZachariahMalachi.com, uh, Facebook. Um, my Instagram is definitely more flooded with, uh, with content, I guess, of all sorts, <laughs> whether it be stupid content or music content or definitely a mixture of my personal life and my music. And I kind of like to keep it that way unless it was to be a problem. You know, I definitely want people to, you know, even if they're interested in just the music to know who I am. Um, I'm not shut off really that much as a person. I, I like to intermingle both of them, but um, definitely any music things that I do, I post on there. Uh, the only thing I've had trouble with recently is trying to keep up on my, on my schedule downtown, you know, uh, cause I do it so much and it's ritualistic at this point to keep posting the same shows that you do every single week, but I'm very blessed to be able to do it as much as I have been. And I like to let people know who come to Nashville, if they were, you know, wanted to come and see me perform anywhere, you know, uh, I'm always, I feel like I spend about three days a week at Roberts Western world, which has been a dream of mine for years to play there, let alone be a resident there quite a bit as much as I have been. I get to play at Layla's a lot. Uh, Acme Feed and Seed has been incredibly good to us. And then uh, with the Cowpokes, my favorite band in Nashville that now I get to be in, uh, we, we have Honky Tonk Tuesday Nights, which has uh, been a huge success for them since they started it about seven years ago. And that's over in Inglewood on Gallatin Pike at the American Legion Post 82. Uh, those guys started it as a really cool hangout. And then now there's documentaries made about it. It's wow. just, uh, it's totally went upside down. It, you could go in there on any night and see someone like uh, Robert Plant in there hanging out. You know, I mean, it's just com- become a complete success from such a small, humble beginning. So really cool. That is, that is awesome. And again, Zechariah, it has been a privilege to have the chance to visit with you. Got to hear a little bit of the Michigan surroundings as well. And <laughs> traveling mercies as you head back to the music city and brother, hopefully we can catch you when you're out on the road. Cameron, anytime, man. I'm glad that we got to talk today. You, you're great, man. You're so much fun. <laughs> well, thanks again for joining us for this 124th episode in Season 2 of Good Questions with Cameron Dole. If you ever have a comment, a question, or maybe anything else you'd like to know, you can hit me up on the contact page at gqwithcam.com. You can also find me on Instagram, Twitter, TikTok, and Facebook, all at GQ with Cam. If you'd like to help out in the funding for this podcast, you can visit our merch store where we've got hoodies, shirts, tumblers, mugs, stickers, and much more. That's GQwithcam.com forward slash shop. If you have a special guest idea, go ahead and email me, GQwithcam at gmail.com. Again, thanks to our good friend Brandon Allen for coming up with our theme music. We're going to let him play us out and hope you guys have a great rest of your Monday.